My name is Ramona Masachi. I'm an artist. Um, I came into learning about MMT from the Bernie Sanders campaign, Stephanie Kelton's work, and I really want to share this knowledge with all of you. So for being here, thank you for bringing questions. They're so appreciated. Uh, I learned from you as well through your questions. Bill Black and June Carbone have justly agreed to spend an hour answering our questions about the chapter. William Black is an assistant professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas. He's a white collar criminal criminalist, a former financial regulator, former banker, and a serial whistleblower. He's a founder of Bank Whistleblower United. June Carbone holds the Robin. Rubina in Law, Science and Technology, University of Minnesota School. She writes about the family and the economy and family and politics. Co author of Red Families, Virtue Families, Legal Pollination and the Creation of Color, and Marriage Markets How Inequality is Remaking the American Family. They are both authors and they're here to answer our questions. Thank you so much for being here with us. Patrick, would you like to ask your question? So uh, my question is, um, after reading this chapter, um, you know, while I really uh, support the job guarantee in the sense of, you know, just kind of a moral sense of giving people jobs, I've still been kind of confused about the idea of how the job guarantee would help to hold down inflation. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe, you know, kind of speak to that point a little bit. Sure. Um it is not designed uh, to hold down inflation. That's not uh, the primary goal, but it is designed uh, most assuredly not to create inflationary pressure. In, in fact, it's designed to be in jargon an automatic stabilizer. An automatic just means what it sounds like. You don't need new federal rules or legislation because it automatically adjusts as the economy adjusts. Right? If lots of people lose their jobs, then presumably they, many people will want to take advantage of the job guarantee. If the economy was near uh, full capacity, uh, many people would presumably leave job guarantee type jobs and go into the sort of regular uh, sector at uh, higher wages. Um, and in that sense, uh, it, it helps things fit uh, automatically what would be right. You get stimulus when you most need it and you get protection when you most need it. And when there's a greatest risk of inflationary pressures, it isn't adding to those inflationary pressures. That's the fundamental idea. Thank you. Most welcome. Um, Gabrielle has a question. You can unmute. Thanks. So it's Gabriel. Um, I okay. am all in on MMT and I'm here to be an advocate out in the wild. And so bef between last class and this class, I was out there saying, so, so first of all, I think ha having less theory to an argument and having actual historical data is the best way I can argue for this. So I said, hey, in 2008, they printed so much money. They printed so much money in 2008 and inflation didn't go up. Ha. Huh. There you go. Prove it. It, it, it. I proved it. Inflation didn't go up. And this guy says, dude, I'm an expert. They hoarded it. The, the rich hoarded the money. So it didn't go into circulation. If they had given all that money they printed to the people, inflation would have skyrocketed. So I just want some help. I, like, honestly, I, I just need arguments that I can say in the past, watch what happened and then not look stupid. <laughs> Well, it's, it strikes me you already won that argument, so I think you're doing fine, uh, but you're right. Uh, let's see, can people read this? What does that say? It says, MMT enjoyed more empirical success over the past 20 years than more conventional approaches. En Cotra Lakota. Cotra Lakota. Okay, so Cotra Lakota is a prominent economist uh, from the very conservative version. Uh, and uh, he's been in discussions with Stephanie Kelton because we don't treat people who disagree with us as the enemy. We try to convince them. 
uh, and we try to learn from them uh, as well. And Coach Lakota, uh, who has a really wonderful sense of humor, let me give you a sense of the slyness of it. Uh, he said, um, all the early forms of modern macro, which is what dominates central banks uh, and is very, very conservative, um, had the same property uh, and that uh, w almost coincidentally, hence the word almost, almost coincidentally, uh, the models made any governmental action harmful and unnecessary, right? So Coach Lakota is someone who uh, has a lively mind, is willing to see strengths in others. And he's said, look, MMT is simply one on what Milton Friedman said should be the decisive standard in economics, predictive ability. So uh, in terms of your friend, I don't even know how you were supposed to deal with this argument by this so-called expert, right? It is true that if you give money to incredibly rich people, um, then the, uh, the what we call the marginal propensity to consume uh, is very low for very rich people. They don't have time to spend their money. I mean, literally they don't have time. Um, so you wouldn't have needed anywhere near, uh, near as big a program, but you still would have needed a stimulus program if it went to poorer people who have a very high propensity to consume. They need to spend it to be able to deal with current uh, expenses. Uh, in that sense, he seems bizarrely to be um, privileging a thing that got far less bang for the buck, uh, which was the, um, I assume the Trump uh, tax cuts he's talking about, or perhaps he's talking before then. Um, Jazz has a question. You can unmute Jazz. Hey, hi, thank you. Um, I'm very excited by this book. I actually, and let me preface my question with, I actually think the biggest problem with the articulation of MMT is that it says deficits don't matter when, if you look at it the right way, deficits aren't real. And I would say, but by that, I mean, like if you just take away the taxing component and say government spends money into existence, where is there a deficit? And if you wanna call that spending a deficit as an accounting matter, well then that implies debt. And then the debt, well, a debt is something that you owe to someone. And you can't actually point and say in that case, who do you owe that to? Who would you settle that debt with if you've just spent the money into existence? So I think that's kind of like a better way to articulate the thing from a, you know, use that toy model where you don't even start with taxes at all and just say, boom. But, so oh, I, 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 I'm going to um, agree with you in the following sense uh, without getting into the absolute best way. Uh, the way you've just explained is frequently used in MMT discussions. So we agree with you. Which ones you, you which particular approach you pick for a popular book? Um, you know, uh, I have no great prior on that. Okay. Um, can you describe in much detail as possible the various ways and tools the federal government has to combat inflation beyond raising taxes? In as much detail as possible, we would be here for a couple of uh, hours just on that one question. Um, so... <laughs> um, you can do all kinds of things to reduce uh, inflation. Um, if you are spending thing, lots of money on programs that don't make sense, you should stop spending money on things that don't make sense because though that spending takes up real resources, it takes up real resources in terms of workers, but also in terms of whatever. You know, so uh, maybe the, uh, you know various components of chips, modern chips, and such. If we use tons of chips for not particularly good purposes, uh, then we don't have the that available in other spheres. So that's one way of doing it. If we're spending way too much money on uh, military, 
you could reduce military spending uh, and that could reduce potential pressures. Now, by the way, a number of these things don't just quote unquote reduce inflation, they actually produce deflation. Deflation is when uh, prices fall, right? And th the two things are not equivalent, all right? So a little bit of inflation and this is a consensus among conventional conservative economists, which is a major change over the last 20 years, they think is a good thing. So virtually all central banks set a target rate of roughly 2% inflation, right? However, a little bit of deflation is a very bad thing, right? In what it can do is, say, uh, is to be self-reinforcing in a very bad uh, fashion. So for example, if um, prices of automobiles are falling 3% a year, well, that's a big expenditure and my car still runs. Why not wait three years? And if a bunch of us, and a bunch could be just a couple hundred thousand, wait three years, then the price of automobiles doesn't go down by 3%, it goes down by 12, 15%, and they're laying off all kinds of workers. And that can have ripple effects uh, throughout the economy. So we don't want to quote unquote, minimize inflation necessarily because that's often producing deflation. So again, it's uh, as Stephanie used, you know, Goldilocks, uh, it's the right temperature, the right size of porridge. Uh, not the biggest or the hottest or the coolest uh, that we want in those uh, circumstances. If we produce things more efficiently, we uh, reduce expenditures. If we fix problems now, instead of letting them go on and grow for 15 years to massive bubbles, we will massively reduce uh, inflationary pressures over a long time period. So uh, uh, what I'm trying to get across is there's a wide range of things that economists don't usually think of in inflation terms that actually are really important to longer term inflation. And let me also mention a lot of inflation is a very bad thing. Hyperinflation is a terrible, terrible thing. And any, if you talk to anybody who's ever grown up in a country that had hyperinflation, it scars that country and those generations for life. And that's very prone to authoritarian leaders, uh, take, in particular the military and a number of parts of the world taking power. That can create a whole lost uh, decades and such. Um, and if you respond as a central bank by squashing things, um, the, the monetary instrument is basically a hammer often. And the, you know, the answer is a bigger hammer. Um, and that's not a good tool to use. For example, if you wanna burst a bubble. So bubbles aren't conventionally go into the creation of the consumer price index. Indeed, if they're in housing, they officially don't go in to the uh, consumer price index, but they create significant inflation in the biggest single asset we buy. So we would really want to prevent harmful bubbles in those kinds of areas as well. What are the best policies against that? Well, that's actually my specialty area. We don't want fraud. We don't want fraudulent non-prime liars loans and appraisal fraud uh, by the industry that's going to create a hyperinflated bubble and is going to destroy 70% um, of the wealth of Hispanic families with a college education, 60% of black families with a college education. These are devastating effects. Again, they're not officially called inflation, but they come from sudden inflation of asset values followed by a collapse of those asset values. And 
when when Stephanie talks about the recovery, she doesn't mean a full recovery. She's talking about a recovery to where we were uh, in 2008, right? So it's you're up here in 2008, then you're down, and then the recovery comes about 2012-ish to or 2011 to 2008 levels. By the way, because the U.S. did a, some stimulus, not remotely an ad adequate stimulus, but because it did, whereas the EU, European Union, overwhelmingly uh, used the opposite, we got back to that level, that break-even level, over three years before the European Union did. That is immensely important in terms of people's lives. But that does not mean that you're back even, right? Because a number of years have gone along and you've lost all that growth, positive growth you should have had. And so the best economic estimate of the lost GDP through the full extent of the recovery is $41.7 trillion with a T. A trillion is a thousand billion. So when conventional economics screws up, it screws up, well, wait a minute, 41.7 trillion, that's, uh, oh, that's about 60 times of the US defense budget for a year. And we got the biggest defense budget in the world, or if you prefer military budget uh, in the world. Uh, I hope that's a sufficient answer to, to the question. It's, as I say, it would take days to um, do everything that can reduce inflation. Uh, Bill, may I may I remind people that if they aren't familiar with with your work and um, that to watch the Khan, which is a great documentary series, and you can find it at the and uh, Real Progressives is putting out a podcast that follows up on it, where Bill and other people talk about uh, go into more depth about things that they discussed in the Khan. Also. Many of us don't know June. I know you said that she could talk about uh, the, the job guarantee and the re how it fits in with research on the family. And so may I ask her to speak to that, please? <laughs> sure, thank you. <laughs> so my work has been looking at the relationship between broader macroeconomic trends the family, the way we think about the family, and the new work I'm doing with uh, Naomi Khan and Nancy Levitt fits in very nicely with this. And it goes like this. Uh, the first piece, and I could spend hours talking about how economists do not understand the family, but something economists tend not to look at at all when they're looking at the family is stability. And stability in terms of both impact on children, they look at that sometimes, the sociologists do. But more critically, income volatility on relationship terms. And so part of what we have done over a series of books that started with red families versus blue families and then went into marriage markets and inequalities remaking the American family is to argue that once you've got two incomes and women have some degree of economic independence, then managing a two-income family in circumstances of income volatility becomes really difficult. And it becomes really difficult because basically there are two things. <laughs> Men at the losing end of male status hierarchies are not great partners. And what you see are things like domestic violence, substance abuse, et cetera, increase in ways that are destabilizing. But even if you look at it solely in economic terms, and you think of two people with income and no reserves, um, you know, the kind of famous statistic that, uh, uh, what is it, Bill, 40% of American families cannot afford to pay out of pocket a $400 debt. Uh, if you think of it that way, what happens when there is an unexpected debt? There are two incomes, very often the money that one party sees as feeding the children has to now go to bailing out the other person. And especially if this is something like traffic tickets, you know, think of speeding violations. <laughs> the famous, you got pulled over because the uh, headlight, because you had a broken taillight. 
those kinds of things that are uh, endemic in areas of uh, racial profiling and um, you know, targeting particular communities, those kinds of unexpected uh, expenses are destabilized. So our new work is putting that together now with the fissured workplace, the end of loyalty, the idea that we take um, employment and we've changed employment from something where the better jobs tend to have an expectation of longevity and have a variety of benefits, pensions, et cetera, built into them and a family wage that tends to reinforce patriarchy but also tends to stabilize relationships. And we destabilized all that. And so what we're doing now is a new book called The New Social Contract, a uh, social compact that is going to end with a discussion of the job guarantee. And basically it makes the following argument. When you had an agricultural economy and in 1800, 90% of Americans lived on farms. You also had a patriarchal economy in which the precondition for marriage for men who were other than very poor was property ownership. And the farm had a subsistence basis of living for the people who lived on the farm. So your safety net was the farm producing subsistence way of living. Industrialization destabilized that. And when you look at the rise of the upper middle class in the 1840s, this is the rise of the separate sphere dependent for the upper middle class on the family wage. And not about so much separating men and women, but rather about collecting the resources for intensive inve uh, investment in children with for the upper middle class education becoming more important and the stay at home mom being critical to the supervision of children in a more dangerous world. But it's about class. It is about specialization among men and increased resources producing that specialization, not as Gary Becker said, specialization between men and women. Our argument is what has happened to the family now is the upper middle class family. By postponing marriage until not only you've graduated from school, but you've had your first four jobs, switch cities twice, and have enough of a safety net to get through a layoff, in which case one party works and the other one goes back to school or takes a lower paid job or commutes for a bit until that party gets back on their feet. And in the meantime, you switch off with childcare. That requires an enormous investment in human resources, in um, the ability to get along with somebody else well enough to get through the ups and downs, but also to generate the resources to go back to school and to be able to trade off in childcare. And we call that in accordance with the new economics of, the fan, of, the, of employment, employability, not employment. Employability is the ability to stay, to stay employed, to get through the downturn, get a new job, come back up and acquire new skills in the process. And if employability is now the key to the upper middle class, it is beyond the reach, <laughs> probably 50% of the population. And that all the things we see as the cuts justified by deficits, um, higher education has gotten a lot more expensive, lots of local schools are a mess, uh, the ability to go back to school once you've left can be expensive and difficult with for-profit universities taking up a lot of that space in ways that involve predatory lending. If you put that picture together, this idea, this new family ideal is beyond the reach of most of the population. And the conservatives, we spent all this time going to the pro-marriage conservative movement say, oh, if only those folks got married. Don't have the kid before 18, graduate from high school, get a job, then get married, everything will be fine. And the answer is no, it won't be fine. Because the new premise is employability, not employment. And the ability to deal with income volatility and ride, ride out the waves. So the work I'm doing on the family, you know, meshes almost perfectly with a lot of the analysis in um, Stephanie's book. And Bill, <laughs> um, can I ask you something? <laughs> Put you back on. On fighting inflation, do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between the Arab oil embargo versus guns and butter as the cause of the inflation we all experienced in the 80s? 
Yeah, so any of you are young, you actually haven't, and American, you haven't actually experienced any <laughs> substantial inflation, uh, but it was really important to the whole development of uh, uh, the alternative view uh, that is dominant, modern macro, um, you know, because uh, it, the, it was viewed by them as discrediting entirely Keynesian uh, type uh, analysis. And uh, Lucas, the, like the, uh, the great grandfather of all this, uh, who got a Nobel Prize, uh, described how, you know, if, in, if the name Keynes was even said out loud at an economic conference, uh, everybody just started rolling the, their eyes and laughing uh, at anyone who would uh, quote such a person. So um, basically, it wasn't um, OPEC, it was the subset, the uh, uh, Arab oil exporting nations had a boycott uh, to try to pressure uh, on geopolitical stuff involving uh, Israel. And that created very quickly an unanticipated price rise in a commodity that goes into a ton of things, energy, right? Uh, and that uh, produced not just a recession, but a recession that proved very difficult to deal with because um, it was combined with inflation. And indeed the phrase stagflation comes uh, from that episode. It uh, destroyed any chance Jimmy Carter had of getting uh, reelected. And it led to the rise of this new paradigm that Coach Lakota was talking about that almost coincidentally um, meant any governmental action was harmful. In other words, it was out of an ideology of laissez-faire. Um, so Keynes never talked about cost push uh, inflation. Uh, it wasn't uh, an issue in his uh, era, uh, but they, they treated it as a destruction and said, okay, we win. So now a couple of Nobel Prize winners have said, wait a minute, if that's the grounds for junking Keynesian thought, you in the great financial crisis just committed an error at least an order of magnitude worse than that. So if we're gonna use your principles, guys, modern macro should collapse. It was a complete failure, uh, not only to predict, but it created policies that made inflation in the context of bubbles that we talked about, very severe in many parts of the world, as bad as the US bubble was in, in uh, residential real estate. and it was the biggest in world history, but we're the biggest country by far in world history in terms of the economy. That same type of bubble in Ireland was twice as big as the United States on a proportion to GDP type basis. So this caused crises all over the world. And it means that MMT Yes, it has the best predictive record, but in some sense, because our opponents have the worst predictive record <laughs> in the history of economists uh, type of thing. So we're, we're always bemused when they say, well, you know, you, you, you folks aren't scientific enough. <laughs> you go, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> You're the people that not only ruined, but uh, the second part of your question, June, it isn't just that it brought us into a crisis, modern macro had no way to get out of the crisis. And literally, and Coach Okoto has also said that the uh, shocks that the modern macro system uses to actually drive its models are patently unrealistic. Let me, this is serious. Their interpretation of the great financial crisis is either that suddenly we lost technological abilities that they collapsed, or second, that literally 20 million people decided they wanted not to be working anymore. Not that they were unemployed, you get it. They just decided they didn't want to work anymore. So these are particularly, should be particularly fertile time period uh, for MMT to displace a really failed uh, alternative uh, view of economics. Bill, I have a question for you. Um, so now that millions of people are out of work, 
and we're not really sure how this administration is going to proceed, if they're going to spend big, um, if those jobs are going to be replaced. Um, and people aren't really buying things as much anymore because they just don't have the money. If this new administration um, doesn't spend big, what what will happen to all of these people and the economy? Because people won't have money to go to school. They won't have, they won't have jobs. They, you know, they're they're in decline. Um, so, it will be first mixed, right? So there's a lot of momentum in recovery, but there are also huge sectors of the economy that are cratering, absolutely cratering. And then there's a whole bunch that are just on the edge of cratering, right? They're like they're rolling and you can see they're about to fall <laughs> off the cliff. So mm -hmm. unless you get really dramatic different approach and really this would be a perfect, in fact, six months ago, eight months ago was perfect for a job guarantee. We could have had people doing contact tracing and all kinds of other programs working up, you know, teaching people who are educators how to actually use remote learning as opposed to blah, 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 uh, type of thing that can't keep anybody's attention. All of that would have been brilliant. The probably this audience, I don't have to do this very much, so I'll do it super brief. The stock market has virtually nothing to do with the real economy. The stock market has virtually nothing to do with the real economy. If I create the biggest tax cut in history, and if I give overwhelmingly the benefits to ultra rich people for the reason the very first question to me asked, mm -hmm. they will save that, which is to say they will invest it. And where will they invest it overwhelmingly in the stock market? So you get a surge. So hopefully the new administration has none of that mindset and realizes that we are about to be in a catastrophe uh, in these circumstances. It is also the case that how soon the economy really recovers has an immense amount to do with how successfully we A, restrain the pandemic growth. Again, we're seeing exponential growth. I don't know if you've seen the curves in Ireland and the UK, they are straight up over the last several weeks. This can get much worse in the next couple of months. People tend to forget that. Um, so vaccine effectiveness and not, I, I will tell you, t tell you from the savings and loan crisis. Uh, I was a financial regulator back then. You cannot succeed in an emergency unless you treat it like an emergency and say, we do not do business as usual. We think completely outside the box. We get it the hell done. We cut through all the crap uh, and do it. I don't personally think that's Biden, <laughs> but maybe that will be his team. Um, and we uh, desperately need that, that this um, response is a classic example of what MMT warns, the difference between a fully sovereign currency nation and a city or a state that isn't sovereign in terms of having a currency. And so we, we have the worst of all worlds where Trump, I think deliberately because he knew it was such a fuck up, put all the onus on state and local governments to actually do the delivery of services, right? People that do not have the ability to do a funding, particularly in the midst of a recession, to handle this properly. This is a classic example of where the federal government should be funding it and then also doing things like, you know, many, many months ago, invoking the Defense Production Act uh, to get things uh, out on an emergency uh, basis. There are far worse things than inflation, right? Shortages of tests, shortages of protective gear. These are murderous in this kind of context. 
People shouldn't even be thinking in terms of inflation. It's the wrong mindset. And again, MMT isn't, can't tell you how you should spend the money, but it does tell you it's really important how you spend the money. So a huge part of our focus has to be on spending the money wisely, right? The MMT doesn't remove the need to think hard and long and work and improve and learn from your mistakes on programs. The best way to discredit MMT is to do a bunch of crappy programs. And can I add one, one quick thing, uh, Bill? The other thing I'm talking about the difference between Keynesianism and MMT is floating currencies. And I don't know if, if there have been a series of questions in the question and answer chat about that. Do you want to say something about it? Well, um, there is a correct criticism of MMT. I think it's kind of inevitable uh, that it uh, is incredibly US focused. Now, one of the prime uh, developers of it and uh, is in Australia, um, but you know, Australia and the United States are actually pretty similar uh, nations in many of the regards that are relevant to this. Uh, in, in particular, we both have really strong ability to make things, right? Uh, and Australia has enormous ability to export uh, things as well. So the question is, to have a fully sovereign currency, you need not just to have be a, you know, a, a nation state uh, with its own currency, but you also have to borrow only in your own currency and you have to let your currency float freely in ter international terms. Otherwise, you put the bankers back in control, right? And that's what Wall Street desperately wants, by the way, politically, folks. They want the control. That's what they hate about MMT, that the people would actually have the control of that device. OK, borrowing only in your currency, that, that any nation can do. Having a sovereign currency, that any nation can do. But a freely floating exchange rate can make trade, international trade, difficult. And it might particularly make it difficult for smaller nations that have one or two exports that, you know, when they have variability, uh, like in the price of oil. Um, could cause a catastrophic loss of uh, finances. So letting exchange rates uh, float freely in those circumstances, there's at a minimum, those nations will have far more reduced scope for policy than would be true of the United States and Australia. And we need to A, acknowledge that, and B, think of, well, are there international mechanisms we could use that could allow nations to have uh, freer use of MMT principles in those circumstances without creating a moral hazard situation in which they can just go crazy and say, okay, you know, <laughs> it didn't work well, Washington will pay for it. Uh, that's not gonna work either. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Brian has a question. Hello, Dr. or uh, Professor Black. This is Brian Lamble in Kansas City. We only, you know, make people that we have direct power, grading power over call us that. <laughs> Bill is fine. <laughs> um, before I ask my question, I just want to say, I'm sure this was mentioned earlier, earlier in the discussion, but uh, if anybody has a chance, take Take your time or take invest your time in reading Professor Black's book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, which is his chronicle of the uh, SNL crisis in the 80s. It is absolutely a terrific book, um, both for uh, financial regulation, policy, um, politics, history, um, and also theories of, of fraud. So I, I highly, highly recommend it. It's terrific. By the um, new edition that also discusses the great financial crisis, but yes, thank you. <laughs> that's yeah, that's kind. right. That's, that's kind. 
so my my question is, I've been reading, I'm just about finished with Aaron Glantz's book, Home Records, which talks about the um, actions of several of Trump's closest economic policy advisors and his treasury secretary and his um, controller of currency and, and how they, they scooped up so many, literally thousands and thousands of homes after the great financial crisis, the, the housing market crisis. And you read it and, and hear so much about how um, through the FDIC and, and the Fed, the federal government was so eager to, for example, with Steve Mnuchin and IndyMac, you know, they buy the bank um, to stabilize it, but then they were so eager to get that bank, quote unquote, off the books um, that they sold it for a song, you know, and that's, that's how people like Steve Mnuchin made billions and billions of dollars, not to mention other policies, government policies that were terrible as far as stop loss and whatnot. So it's really just it's not so much of a question, but just if you wouldn't mind talking about that and talking to how MMT could really radically change that, that posture of government holding, publicizing you know, market failures um, and, and stop really shooting itself in the foot by then immediately trying to turn it over to bad actors who are, you know, essentially just profiting off of misery and loss. Sure. Um, so we can actually fit this into inflation <laughs> if we, you know, in terms of price level and such. Again, this is a, a product of a bubble. And conventional uh, economists, Fama famously, said there ain't no such thing as a stinking bubble. Uh, and such, got a Nobel Prize for it. And in the same year, they gave Schiller an award for saying that Fama was BSing. So you can get it, economics is the only field in which you can get Nobel Prizes for saying the opposite. Um, kind of interesting stuff in itself. Dealing, the by far the best solution, of course, is to prevent the crisis. And we can spot these kind of bubbles. And more particularly, we can spot the kind of bubbles that are being driven by fraud epidemics. And so in terms of type one, type two error, there's no problem. You know, We don't really care whether it was fraud or whether it was excessive risk. In either case, it will produce a disaster, right? And so we want the government to intervene and prevent it before it ever becomes a crisis. And the book you talked about talks about the fact that we deliberately intervened to crush a bubble and did so successfully, right? Uh, so that's the first best solution. Now, second best, as you say, is after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression and for some years afterwards, we said, why should we sell all these distressed properties from the failed banks into the private sector, particularly early? They'll make a killing off of it if they're buying at these super depressed rates because markets overcorrect. They go down too low. And relatively quickly, once you stabilize them, you get 20% gains, right? That's a very common thing. Why wouldn't we have that gain go to the public? Right. You'll note that when we bailed out these entities and when we made these incredible loans to them where we saved them, we could have said what any private sector party would have done. That's great. Now you give us equity. Right. You give us equity so that if you gain, the American people get the gain as well. So you are correct that there, I don't know that it really fits into MMT, but it, it's certainly my work, uh, kind of work uh, saying, uh, we should you know, not be stupid. We should get the upside. And by the way, this does fit into more generally our discussion of public finance, uh, because what these entities, Mnuchin type funds do, and it's not, by the way, it's not just the United States, they're highly active in Ireland, where I spend a fair amount of time. Uh, doing stuff. And they get so big that they have market power, but more to the point, they have political power. Mm -hmm. right? they, they own 20% of the houses in some, play, in some cities. And so what, the first thing they do in the US context is go in uh, in a massive uh, effort to reduce on the basis of the depressed price at which they bought it, 
the assessed value of the property and the funding levels of that community crater when they do that. So this is a, a really bad thing. So you raise an important point and there are things we can do about them. And again, you, you would hope with a new in administration that we could at least get entre entree uh, to try to make our arguments as, as to why to do things better. Um, thank you so much, Bill. Gabriel has a question again. I think he wants to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Um, I really appreciated the, the broad conversation of the in-depth intellectual stuff. I I guess I'm recognizing I'm here for one purpose. I'm here for arrows in my quiver to go argue for MMT. And I asked the question earlier, when I said to that person in 2008, we printed all the money and inflation didn't go up. And I thought that was, I thought it was a powerful thing for me to say to them. They said, no, it didn't go up because money was hoarded. So that defeated my argument that printing money doesn't create inflation. So I guess like, just tell me, do I reformulate that argument or give me a better arrow for my quiver? And I'm not, I don't want theory. I want examples in history where I can say this happened, the Fed prints tons of money and inflation doesn't go up. Well, I'm sorry, but I said you won the argument. He just, no, in, in, he just oh, did Bill, better. Bill, Bill let, me, I didn't, let me ask you. No, did, do you agree that what Obama did was to print money that went overwhelmingly to the wealthy? Or was there also money that went overwhelmingly through things like the payroll tax holiday uh, that went to lots of other people too? His premise is that uh, such a huge percentage of the stimulus package went to rich people. And which okay, so which stimulus first? I mean, yeah. You just have somebody that invented a fact that wasn't true, right? In response to what you said. Now, the only thing that comes even remotely close to that is the Trump tax cuts, which were not a stimulus. As June just said, all the stimulus programs went to many people and many of them went to poor people with a high marginal propensity to consume. And the money was not in fact hoarded. And that's true, not just in the United States, but wherever those stimulus programs were used. And in zero of those countries, in response to the 2008 financial crisis, did stimulus uh, simply get hoarded. In right. every case right. in which it was used, and there have been studies, you find in fact that the growth rate accelerated and that you didn't have inflation. You had we would say every Bill, can I can I interrupt? Every MMT economist I've ever heard on this would say none of the uh, financial crisis stimulus packages were big enough to do the trick MMT wants, and therefore they don't prove that a properly large stimulus package would not cause inflation. It is true that you could develop a stimulus program large enough that produced inflation. Uh, we, that is certainly something you could do. None of them, as you say, were uh, close. And by the way, let me tell, get you back to, the, the, to uh, 2009. At, in 2009, the administration, the incoming Obama administration, did talk with us not with me personally, but uh, you know, some more senior folks. And they deliberately used us. I'm not upset, at, I'm not complaining about this, but they deliberately used us. They said, we want you to make public how big the stimulus should be. Because mm -hmm. then when we come in with our, what was originally, I think an 840, 840 billion program, it will sound much more reasonable. And we were happy to do that, right? So we were telling people that the package needed to be at, you know, more than twice as large. They were agreeing with us behind the scenes. And their explanation for why they went much smaller was it was, uh, you know, it'd be dead on arrival politically. 
if they came in with a higher number. But that means that the last time there was really a stimulus package large enough to have the kind of impact we're talking about is the Johnson era. And well, no, because again, there are we have a natural experiment. Mm -hmm. um, the natural experiment was that there are many different responses across the world. And the US response, as inadequate as it was, and I think politically it was disastrously inadequate, right? I think it really set the uh, stage for the in immense uh, losses of, of uh, congressional and Senate seats that the Democrats experienced. So I, I think it was a really bad thing that they did in terms of opportunity cost. But having said that, as I said, we reached pre-crisis levels three years, a full three years before the EU did because they had virtually no stimulus. So no, there, the, the, even inadequate stimulus was effective indeed when the IMF of all folks, IMF is the temple erected to celebrate austerity. The IMF economist said that not only was stimulus effective, it was more effective than the proponents had uh, used in their own models. So that's the answer and, and, and it produced no inflation. In, indeed, it not only produced no inflation, not a, nobody in the EU and the United States, none of us reached our inflation targets of one and a half to 2% inflation during that entire period for other than, you know, maybe once a, one month out of uh, literally 12 years. So, and for technical reasons, inflation is probably overstated by the consumer price index. So we were actually probably deflationary for most of the period. So not only did we not produce inflation and, not, and it wasn't hoarded, it was spent, but it was effective in reducing unemployment. And if we had done it adequately, it would have been much more effective. Okay, I hope that answers Gabriel's question. Um, uh, maybe so I should deal with the question in the chat about uh, the difference between what the heck QE is. Okay, please stimulus. do. Okay, go ahead. Stimulus, that's fiscal side. QE, that's monetary side. For technical reasons, the treasury is most effective in moving short-term interest rates. Investment, which is what they want to prompt, is most affected by long-term interest rates. So what they do is deliberately infuse money in a way designed to bring down long-term interest rates. In a sense, there was a lot of hoarding in the following sense. One of the major developments over the last 15 years is stock buybacks, right? The whole idea, as Stephanie explained, was if we have lower interest rates, that's in business terms called a hurdle rate that you have to get over. You know, your project, if interest rates are 7%, your project better earn at least, or have an expected earning of at least 9% to get over that hurdle and give you some real profit, right? That's the general idea. So lower interest rates under this theory will lead to many more productive projects and then growth will spur and then wages can go up and all those great types of things. What we're seeing is extraordinary off the charts buy stock buybacks in which companies are saying, I have no productive use for this money. And what they're really saying, of course, is the CEO's bonus is tied to stock price. And if I do stock buyback, stock price will go up and I will be richer. So again, that's just more of my type stuff that I specialize in. We have incredibly perverse executive compensation incentives and my work and uh, some of June's work 
explores the many pathologies that that creates. Um, Bill, how do we get people um, in office and in charge that won't allow, uh, you know, companies to get away with this? Well, okay, so both parties since um, all the way back to Jimmy Carter uh, have, and of course his predecessor that was largely this way, although Nixon had a lot of regulations, but the new Democrats and officially there weren't new Democrats of Jim, Jimmy Carter, but he's basically the predecessor of the new Democrats. They said, what we have to do is get away from the old democratic ideas, in particular, this idea of the New Deal. Um, that's archaic, obsolete. We need to be thinking of modern terms. We need to make finance in particular our ally, right? And then they added in high tech and the, you know, largely the movies and, and such. And Tom Frank writes about this a great deal if the, you're interested uh, in these kinds of things, right? The, and so when they married Wall Street, they got their big source of financing as well. Obama went as soon as he was elected president in front of the caucus, the New Democrat caucus legislators and said, I am a New Democrat, quote unquote. Right, He gets to the very first State of the Union that he does, and he says, Americans are, in response to the Great Recession, pulling in their belts, the government needs to do the same. Well, obviously, the government needs to do the opposite, precisely because people are engaging in what Keynes called the paradox of thrift in these circumstances, which makes recessions deeper and um, self-fulfilling, you know, self-perpetuating uh, in these circumstances. Obama also um, in the first year was asked by a reporter, when will we run out of money? This is the quintessential question that makes MMT mine, you know, our heads explode. And Obama's response was, and I, um, this is all uh, pretty close to a direct quotation, we already have. So we start with a leadership class all of whom believe this, the, the most important fact that Stephanie gave in that chapter that isn't public notice in, you know, uh, in quite the same way is that every member of the committee bought into the idea that the federal government is really just like your household, mm -hmm. right? That's how big a job we have in front of us. Yeah, and can I, can I answer this question too? Please do. Very different, very different take. And, and the question you wanna ask is, what is the focal point for organizing going to be? So what the Republican Party has done is to attack the unions, dismantle the unions and build the churches as the union halls of the Republican movement. What's the counter move? The job guarantee offers the possibility of public jobs that become a community focal point. And that also has political implications, even if you do not have those jobs be a center of political organizing. MMT scholars have always seen the job guarantee as not an incidental, but as basically a partnership of ideas that we think is absolutely essential, but we also think it's incredibly saleable, right? And that it is the type of idea that if it was ever implemented, they couldn't get rid of because it would be so immensely popular with the people of every nation in which it was done. Now, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It's a big program. I would experiment with lots of different delivery systems and I, I gonna want to give this warning. Um, I'll just tag one of June's thing from her study of the family. Why jobs? You could just give income. Here's my criminologist hat and some of June's research. Unemployed guys are screw ups, 
right? Statistically, not, I don't mean that they get unemployed because they get screwed up. I mean, men react very badly to unemployment. They actually do less housework when they have no job than when they have a job when they're in a relationship with a woman, okay? In criminology terms, all kinds of bad things happen when people are unemployed. So this is not a program to force people to work, but to give the option for everyone who wants to work to be able to do that. And we think it'll be, as we said, it's an elegant program because it doesn't require, oh my God, there's a great recession, we need legislation. No, it's already in place. It's already set to expand or contract automatically with the needs. And as June said, we live in this incredibly vulnerable society where a huge proportion of our population, usually figured at 40%, cannot take a $400 shock. Well, a $400 shock is anything. A minor fender bender is 400 bucks. Your kid has a dental emergency, that's 400 bucks. Your, the person you love trips and he or she breaks their ankle, that's 400. They get a DUI ticket, that's 800 dealing with these things. And so this fact that you have no stability shows up in lots of other things as well. And you can see the death rates on opioids and such just skyrocketing, right? We try to get across it ain't just dollars. It is immensely important to the quality of life. It is important, critical to life itself in terms of suicides and such. And the morbidity, the excess morbidity and premature deaths has actually turned the United States so that the male life expectancy fell in recent years. That is off the charts craziness in these circumstances. So that too is something, and again, and that's why Stephanie put it in a chapter about inflation. Kalia, go right ahead, unmute. Hi, okay. Um, so my question was about the jobs guarantee and Stephanie was talking about making it um, community jobs that contributed to the community and fulfilled uh, needs within the community. And then she also talked about how that would simultaneously create a job pool for when the economy picked back up. And she talks about how people who have been unemployed for a longer period of time have difficulty becoming reemployed because people, uh, corporations don't want to take a chance on them. They've been out of the market. Are their skills current, et cetera? So my question was, if those jobs in the job guarantee are actually fulfilling a community need, then if we simultaneously use those people as a job pool, does that then hurt the community because you are now pulling people from those important jobs? June, do you want to do it or do you want me to do sure. it? I think, I mean, when we've looked at this as, I mean, the comparison we often make is between something like uh, an income guarantee of the kind Andrew Yang talked about and the job guarantee, which is going to provide better stability. And the problem, I mean, the administrative complexity of a job guarantee is considerably greater. And yes, it's going to be a problem, but Think of it this way too. I mean, a lot of the jobs now that you know we just love to be able to fill are community centers. Community centers that provide daycare. Uh, when you take a look at who are the women, who are the mothers least likely to be working, <laughs> it, it is the people married to the Trump cabinet and the and and poor women. Why are poor women not in the labor market? They don't have skills and they can't afford childcare. Now look at schools, look at after school care, look at the way you could uh, create a seamless community of after school programs if you had that kind of you know, reserve body of the unemployed. What many mothers do, including our daughter, uh, decided uh, you know, quit, quit her job when she had kids, 
two-year-old and four-year-old, she's now working as a preschool teacher. She's not being paid very much, but they're getting free tuition, so it's worth it. If you think about those kinds of community projects, uh, and I'm focusing on women-oriented ones because they're the ones I know best, but if you think about that, what happens now with the upswing? The answer, the women who are supplying the preschool, if they've acquired skills, are gonna be hired someplace else. But if they're hired someplace else, they may be able to afford paid childcare, bidding up the price of childcare in the private sector, not through the job guarantee, which is going to be lower pay. So you may end up privatizing those jobs in effect. Bill, I leave to you the question how seamless versus lumpy this is, <laughs> what worries me. No, I think it's an excellent question. And uh, there is no perfect answer to a lot of these things. Let, let me also just mention um, for people who are, you know, very kumbaya, we have to be able to fire people in a job guarantee program. You can't have a child molester, right? Um, you can't have somebody who's taking photos of the kids the little kids and, you know, selling the photos. You can't have people who are stealing. You can't have people who uh, completely shirk, you know, don't uh, show up or, or show up uh, drunk all the time. Um, and, you know, some, some people aren't just going to flunk out of this system. Others, as you say, will be doing really well uh, and they'll be in an important function. Some of them will choose to stay, right? Doesn't matter what the state of the economy, it'll be a rewarding job. And uh, as in the case of our daughter, it will be an adequate pay. But others will want, you know, to change jobs and make $4 more an hour, which they might in a pure private sector job. We're not going to try to trap people into the, that, you know, no, nor are we going to try to guilt them. <laughs> Uh, in uh, those circumstances, but you're right. That means someone who was a really good, you know, nursery, kindergarten uh, person will go off and do something that maybe is less good for the world in some, you know, broader sense. Um, but I, I don't think the alternative is, is better. Um, uh, I think we want to let people make those kind of choices for themselves. Kathleenus says, I can think of a million care jobs, not mm -hmm. just for children, for the elderly, for the planet, you know, uh, converting empty lots into public gardens, uh, playing basketball with kids after school, that there are so many care jobs. But mm -hmm. one of the things that um, Steve Grumbine has talked about a lot is that excites him is that a job guarantee is a democracy enhancer mm -hmm. because it is locally administered. So he's always imagining the sort of old fashioned town meetings where people mm -hmm. decide what do we need in this? What do we need in our community? But my question is um, what, what Warren Moser always says is if you need the job, then it shouldn't be part of the job guarantee. It should, it should just be there. You should be hiring people to do these things if you need them. As a, and he definitely just sees it as a temporary. So my answer is if it's an essential job, of course you need to be hiring those people. And uh, then you're gonna be offering more money if it truly is essential and you wanna retain uh, top people in those circumstances um, and the public sector uh, should be paying uh, for those kinds of jobs. Uh, I agree that uh, making use of local governments and NGOs as a unique uh, ability to do it better. But again, I would caution, A, it doesn't have to be the same everywhere. There could be different delivery systems in different circumstances. And B, I would really caution that we should experiment with yeah. different approaches and see what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be fixed uh, before we expand uh, the program as opposed to somebody uh, creating the ideal system 
and suddenly, you know, slam, we have 8 million people in it. Yeah, and can I, can I comment briefly? So on the political part, again, what the Republican strategy has been is starve the beast. When you do that, government doesn't work. Then you create an alternative identity that is locked into the idea government can never work. This is the reverse. This is government doing things you see happening. Government has to work. And that has reinforcing effects. The second thing are there are comments from the chat about uh, referring to Warren Mosler and the idea of traditional jobs. And this fits into what I'm saying with the restructuring of the workplace toward employability rather than employment. And so when you think of what a traditional job is, it allows you to acquire skills you don't currently have that allow you to get the next job. And that's the ideal. You don't really ideally want people stuck in these jobs. You would like them to have these jobs and allow them to move on. I think the harder uh, part is simply reliability. And so there's some wonderful studies on recidivism in prison. And we had a talk by somebody not too long ago that indicated that if you had a halfway house with drug testing of your halfway house residents and minimum wage jobs, it cut recidivism by 60%. And our audience said, but where are you going to get the jobs? And the guy who's, who had run these programs explained, there are all kinds of employers out there who are desperate for people who will work for minimum wage jobs and show up every day. So <laughs> the trick with the halfway house is if they don't show up, they go back to jail. But those who do show up um, have because of the stability and security it adds to their lives, dramatically lesser recidivism rates to people without minimum wage jobs uh, at places like McDonald's. Think of how weird the current system is. You have all the Milton Friedmans of the world, of, you know, super laissez-faire, hard right and such. And what have they adopted as their inflation employment policy? Marx, that we need a reserve army of the unemployed to prevent inflation. And that reserve army should number in the millions of people. And because we never want to be behind the ball on inflation, we should add some extra millions of unemployed to make sure we have a cushion and don't produce those bad things. That's how crazy the current system has been. Doesn't that just put everybody on like food stamps and welfare? Which? Like the, the, having people purposely, millions of people purposely being unemployed. Doesn't oh, that no, just- that, No, 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 no. They would love to take the food Get stamps Get rid of away. all that too. Let them starve. <laughs> now, in this country, there used to be a strong cons- um, consensus it was the political compromise that was obvious. You had the progressives that wanted food stamp and you had the relatively conservative ag states that wanted food stamps. One party has become so radicalized that it w- will screw its economic interests to screw poor people. Mm-hmm. But that is a coalition that possibly could get reestablished with maybe a third of the elected representatives from those states. Okay, let's push for a job guarantee. I've, I've always been for a job guarantee and I would love to see people have local jobs that increases the productivity and the security and the happiness of their communities. The right wing th- uh, think tanks, which of course don't allow thought, are explicit about this, that it is critical to stop these programs from ever being created, because if they're created, A, they'll work, and B, they'll be spectacularly successful. These, uh, the opponents are not worried in the least about government programs that fail. They love them. They use them as ammunition. They're scared to death of successful government programs that transform large aspects of life. Just like think of working five days a week as opposed to seven. 
you know, think of the ability to have a vacation. As soon as that happened, people said, oh my God, life is much better. <laughs> and they've never been able to go back in the most conservative state. So would conservatives just really like death and misery? I don't understand. No, they would like profit. Aha, uh -huh. profit for themselves. Profit Personal for profit. CEOs and uh, other, again, it isn't just the rich. It's actually the top one thousandth of one percent of the rich that get the vast increase the, in wealth that we've seen over the last 20 years. And the rest of the 99.99% can't come together and create this for ourselves. So from uh, the key years are uh, what June's question set up about the uh, inflation, the theme for today, but this one, the cost push inflation uh, of the uh, oil um, clampdown. And from that time, the median, okay, this is a super quick foray into statistics, folks. Median is middle. Mean is average. They're not the same. And on things like income, the mean is pulled up massively by the ultra wealthy. So you, when you want to talk about how people's lives are actually lived, make sure that they're using median in these circumstances. Okay. If you look at the median wage, essentially there's been no growth since about the 1970s to the current point in the worker. That is a staggering change. And this is with a bazillion new Democrat and conservative Republican initiatives, all of which they promised us would lead to a vast expansion of growth and wages that have done the opposite. And that's why you see a you, uh, that's among the reasons, not the reason, that you see this incredible section of disaffected Americans. Now, I think they've got their analysis and their villains all wrong. And yes, I'm old enough. I grew up in Michigan among these people. Yes, I know about racism. I know about pervasive racism. George Wallace won the Democratic primary for Michigan's votes. George Wallace, when I was a kid out there. But they aren't only racists and economics matters as well. And as Tom Frank said, this idea of the Democrats basically kicking the working class and unions you know, to the curb, um, and yes, I know how bad police, I'm a criminologist, I know how bad police unions are, uh, but lots of unions aren't, uh, and it's a really grave political mistake. Um, I think this is our, our last question before we open it up for everyone. Um, Bakari, are you here? He has a question. Yeah, um, so I'm sorry to break the um, train of thought on the um, jobs guarantee, but I was wondering about uh, foreign impact the uh, flow, of, flow of currency in the US. In other words, I mean, we know companies are getting a lot of their money from, you know, overseas, from different things they do overseas. So did, so that money comes back into the US economy, right? So does that have impact on, on things and how so? Whoa, <laughs> it's, it's a really good question. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty complex uh, question uh, <laughs> as well. Um, so, and some of it gets into some of my work as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, uh, MMT uh, per se. Where earnings occurs is a fascinating question. And I know probably the rest of you aren't as fascinated as me, so I'll try to do a super short version. If I am the CEO of a corporation, I'm going to make sure that earnings appear 
to have been earned in whatever the low tax country is. And that is simple for me to do. This, by the way, explains Ireland and huge growth, right? So the, we have all this cover story about Ireland and, and tradition and, uh, and they speak English and all that type of stuff. But what they do is have a tax rate, half that of the rest of Europe, corporate tax rate, half that of the rest of Europe. So I put a building in Ireland and that building I ship computers, whatever, that have two components that when we twist things become the finished product. And then I sell it officially on the, that basis. And I ascribe this immense gain to the Irish operation of twisting those two bolts. Right? It obviously had nothing to do with that. So you cannot track the earnings in any real sense geographically for these multinational companies because they all play this game uh, of having the earnings in the low tax area. So, and plus accounting earnings don't tell you anything about where the cash is actually located. So the second thing, I will often keep the cash offshore for additional tax avoidance reasons. So when they talk about bringing the money back to the United States, well, first, even if they do, remember our earlier discussion, what are they overwhelmingly doing in corporations these days? Putting that money in productive investments or buy back stock, right? This is one of the reasons growth has stalled, wages have stalled. CEOs bonuses are incredibly perverse. So the flows um, mostly again are nominal. And in any event, money doesn't matter in this sense, right? I can get the money I want. I can borrow it for next to nothing. I have retained earnings. That's why they're buying back stock. So it's, there's no shortage of cash to make investments. The firms can make investments for all the reasons modern monetary theory is particularly good at uh, explaining, right? Um, and, and then on top of that, there's sanction busting and uh, you know uh, money laundering uh, as well in these operations. June, you wanted to? I don't know if the question goes to this and <laughs> please tell us if it doesn't, but um, uh, I mean, at least when I've heard Stephanie talk about this in terms of the importance of the sovereign currency, it's also that you have um, something of an automatic stabilizer in this sense. Let's say you spend a lot of money and you do end up with inflation, which increases the price of American goods made in the United States. That means you're going to sell less of those goods abroad, which because uh, the impact in the US dollar may, may be such that if American goods priced in American dollars rise, Bill, tell me if I'm getting this right, then, uh, or do we have it backwards? No, I mean, you, that, that is a possible scenario. Right, so what would happen is then demand decreases, which has a cooling effect in the economy. Flip that, suppose that the American dollar uh, is devalued, that's what I'm getting mixed up. But you do have an effect where what is going on in terms of the price of goods within the US and the floating currency adjusts for some of the things linked to inflationary forces and recessionary forces when they correlate with the price of the currency. And so the international flows also depend on uh, essentially how the dollar is ranked compared to other currencies. But I may have gotten that bill, if I got that wrong, Correct me. <laughs> it's it's not even that that it's wrong, but the the standard um, neoclassical economic analysis, the standard IMF analysis, says the great financial crisis was caused by the excessive inflows of capital mm -hmm. into the United States because we supposedly kept our interest rates too low. 
and that that somehow magically produced a bu bubble. For another day, but a broader discussion, why are we talking about debt so much, right? We live, our solution to all kinds of problems of the poor has been, let's have the poor borrow more. That, as in most students know, is not a particularly bright explanation uh, for all of this. Uh, so we should also have, um, you know, an MMT discussion someday about, you know, it would be really good to basically put the for-profit universities out of business because they're fraud schemes uh, that produce uh, inferior education at a much inflated price uh, and such. Um, so there are lots of things we can do with federal funds that we're not doing for stupid reasons uh, that come from a, a long history of a gold standard that went away decades ago and our whole system is built around complying with a system that hasn't existed for what many of the people listening to this talk was their entire lives. I love um, what you said about private universities. Uh, Ramona said that there would only be one more question, but we're gonna have another one, right, Ramona? Yeah, I think Jazz has a question. Yeah. Go for it, Jazz. Yes, hi, thanks. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around um, um, what I think is, is a little bit more complicated aspect of inflation, which is asset class inflation. And I mean, we're, our thesis being, you know, we don't have a fiscal constraint, we have a productive capacity constraint. Um, and that the indicator that you're meeting that constraint is inflation. And what I'm seeing is we don't have this real world inflation, real economy inflation, but we've got all this asset class inflation. And it, it's like, if you think of that as where we're parking our inflation, you know, in the rise of the stock market, that's and it's now detached from all fundamentals and in Bitcoin and in real estate and in college tuition, um, and that, you know, it feels like, you know, you've got money at the low end of the economic ladder is really fast. It's got a high velocity, but money wants to float. It wants to go up to that economic ladder and it slows down and it gets to a point where once it's at a, it's at a certain point on the economic ladder, it exits the real economy and, tr and has to tra chase returns that to, to avoid, it, to beat inflation. So it goes into the stock market and into all these other places. And as long as it never comes back, I don't actually care, but when it but it creates those bubbles and and how do you how do you in that environment measure the productive capacity and make a determination basically about what your the the, the reasonable government spending can be when you've got that kind of dynamic going on? Um, does that make sense? Yes. Um, again, it's a highly sophisticated question that uh, gets into uh, innumerable things. So, of course, you, it got asked as the last question <laughs> when we're over time. So it, here's the short version. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, there is a missing area of analysis precisely because it doesn't go into the price indexes. And uh, that is these enormous inflation of asset values due to fraud slash bubbles slash fraud and predation and uh, hyperinflated bubbles. And those have potentially immense consequences. That's what my work focuses on in large part. Um, that's an area also though that Fadl's work um, do, deals with a lot. And I think he uh, did the first, uh, maybe in this series. Is that correct, Ramona? Yes, he did. He did the first. Right. Um, and, and so he looks at things like, where do we have really significant sectoral inflation? Uh, and healthcare uh, is the obvious example in the United States. And as June and I have been talking about, it has immense consequences. Uh, particularly in marriage and children uh, and simply morbidity and, and uh, all those good types of things. But we typically ignore it. E economists typically ignore it. So people like Fadl and, and, and I are 
really microeconomics folks that you know are creating sort of a, it's not the same as but like micro foundations uh, for MMT is is sort of how we see uh, our work um, and different people focus on different things. There's a as this discussion alone has brought, you could have 80 good research topics out of what people have been talking. And all of them ha are important to real policy. And that's another reason why, you know, there's a not enough of us, but we come from, um, we teach at small heterodox schools um, often that, uh, you know, we're always uh, existing by holding on with our fingernails in terms of uh, financing, uh, hostile administrations, as you might expect. God forbid the state legislature should ever learn about us. <laughs> they would wipe us out uh, type of thing. Uh, so there aren't nearly enough people doing it. And uh, we will, you know, we always in part talk, make these, uh, talk, take these opportunities to talk with people uh, to get them interested in the areas and uh, working uh, themselves. And June has. Yeah. All right. I good. want to respond to this issue. Yes, this is a microeconomic issue and it's a series of discrete parts and I think they need to be separated. The first is you always get into trouble if you do this thing that Bill will be happy to tell you about in his book. Um, and that is if you subsidize one part of an economy and take off the controls in the other part, guaranteed disaster. That's savings and loan crisis. It's also for-profit universities. So when you're talking about for-profit universities as opposed to state universities, uh, there was an increase in the amount students can borrow and you have a private industry that is primed, you can view that whether a pun or not, uh, to take advantage of that uh, private universities spend dramatically more on advertising than any other educational institution in the country. That problem is a problem related to fraud, the lack of, uh, of quality controls, and the market will not work. And the answer Betsy DeVos has is, oh, let the market supply all education and rip you off. That's one kind of problem. But there's a second kind of problem inequality. So part of what drives up educational costs is competition for elite status. One of the things that I found fascinating, and Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz's work on this is just wonderful, the race between technology and education. And what she indicates is that where you have true commitment to equality, relative egalitarian communities in the United States historically, you have much greater investment in public education. It's relatively accessible and it's relatively affordable. When you start competing and competing for prestige and at the same time start uh, the budgets of state universities, University of Minnesota, yay, <laughs> where I am, uh, you're, you're going to push costs up. Now, the reason for that is actually quite complex, but at the core of it is greater inequality. Those two things are not necessarily directly related. There are different issues. And I think it is a mistake to think of them as the same kind of thing. And then you've got the competition for limited skills, think science engineering. Uh, but I'm gonna stop there. And I'm gonna thank Ramona again for, and uh, all of the folks at Real Progressives uh, for doing the incredible amount of work required to uh, make this real. And thank you everybody so much. who participated, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank, you. thank you for the brilliant suggestion of bringing June on. Okay. Yeah, well, it's, my <laughs> it's not my better half for the last 41 uh, years, it's my better seven eighths. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Ramona, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I'm looking forward to seeing more of you, June. Um, thank you, Bill. Thank you, June, for being with us. Thank you for teaching us and having patience for all of our questions. Um, we're, we're a community of um, 
uh, people who are learning and growing in MMT uh, and our numbers are growing and we really need you. So thank you for, for teaching us.